So we've got some lights in our scene, but as we noticed, Robbie still is glowing like Christmas, not using any lighting, not animating, looks kind of stiff. And so let's fix that. Let's add some animations. And so we're going to do a few things. So one, we're not necessarily going to do some sprite animations on Robbie, and we're going to see why in a second. We're also going to make you know, lighting apply to Robbie and, and a few of these things. We're going to kind of finish that particular aesthetic of the scene. So go ahead and switch there. All right. So as I was saying here, we've got, you know, uh, Robbie, and Robbie's still using this sprite without this material. I could apply a material to the sprite render on Robbie that had normal maps and emissives. That would work just fine. However, you know, Robbie needs to animate, and so I would have to create sprite sheet animation with a bunch of frames for all of my different animations, plus normal maps for all of my frames, plus spec maps for all of my frames, keep them in sync, those tend to be big, bigger, I have to keep them all in memory, um, and or I'd have to have several different maps and swap out materials at runtime, which I also don't want to do, plus there's an outline shader around Robbie that should always be like pure black, so if I was using any material that used lighting, I'd have to have a, come up with some, you know, cut out way to make that not be, or not receive lighting or else it would look weird. So we're going to do something a little bit different, all right? We're going to utilize the actual model they use for Robbie in the actual game, which is using skinned mesh renders, not sprites. Flat skinned mesh renders, but skinned mesh renders nonetheless. That's going to give us the ability to do things like mesh deformation in our animations. We'll have to be able to split up our meshes so your hand will be separate from your torso, will be separate from your head, and so on and so forth. Um, and we can have different materials and different layers and different spacing and all that. It's going to look better. It's going to perform a lot better. So I've got, you know, Robbie here. Robbie's got uh, the, the sprite render on it. I'm going to go to my Robbie folder right down here. And earlier, Andy had mentioned this Robbie uh, underscore body game object. Well, this is a, uh, a model that has been imported, right? This is a skinned mesh renderer model developed, I believe, in 3D Studio Max. And I'm just going to drag this onto the Robbie game object itself and uh, here in the scene. And when I do that, I'm going to notice that uh, Robbie has a sort of a, a weird little twin on him there. Oh, let me do that. Weird little twin just sort of hanging out right behind him there. That is this body. And if I look at it, let's see what's going on here. So we've got the Robbie body, uh, which has an animator on it. And as I expand it, it has a hand a hand and a head and a leg, a leg and some skeletal rigging. This is a model. It just happens to be a flat model. And so if I now click on uh, my Robbie game object, I can disable my sprite renderer. And there's Robbie with lighting, how Robbie's going to look. And what's neat is we can see the lighting affects it. Even the, the cookie uh, cast the shadow on him there, just like we would expect. Because again, this, this mesh renderer has materials on it already that have the normal maps just for the arm have the normal maps just for the leg. So instead of having huge normal map sheets for all my sprite sheet animation, I have a small arm texture, a small arm normal map, a small arm uh, uh, specular um, uh, metallic map, and I'm just using mesh deformation to bend it and move it and stuff like that, like you do with a normal model in a 3D game. All right, so we're able to do that. So another thing that is on this Robbie body, uh, as we can see here, it has an animator already, which I'll look at in a second, but it has this player animation script. And I want to take a quick look at this. It's not a very complex script. As a matter of fact, I, I mentioned in the commenting of the script that you would normally not even have this script. Normally, the functionality of the script would go in something like your player movement script. I've only separated them out for the purposes of teaching. So we can see today one and then the other. But you know, some of this functionality is a bit redundant. So inside this script, first I need references to a bunch of different you know, components that I'm going to need. And then I'm going to use some int IDs for parameters. Now normally you would talk to your animator by passing in some string for some parameter, but that's really inefficient, using strings, passing in strings or doing memory allocation, which you know, may not be a problem when you're dealing with desktop, but if you're dealing with mobile, string allocations will cause garbage collection, which will cause frame rate drops on mobile devices. So we want to avoid that. So we're going to use integers instead. Inside start, we're just going to figure out the string to hash equivalents of all these parameter names. So I have a parameter. We're going to look at the animator here in a second, but I have a parameter called is hanging. But instead of passing in that string, I'm going to convert that to an integer, which I store, and now I'm just passing integers. No memory allocation, no string comparisons, much more fast and efficient. You're also going to notice that I'm grabbing the transform parent 
and I'm finding these components on the parent. And you might be wondering, well, why not just put this script on Robbie itself? Why keep it on Robbie body? And the answer is, inside our animations for walk and for crouch, we have animation events that are going to say, play a footstep audio sound when the foot hits the ground. That needs to call a script on the same game object as the animator, and that's what we're going to use to play our footstep sounds throughout the game so they're in sync with our animations. Inside update, we're just going to update the things for movement. This is hanging, is on ground, is crouching, our velocity and our speed. And these are the methods here, step audio and crouch step audio, that are called from the animations that are saying this is when we play this sound. We're going to look at this in Unity, but this is the code that makes it work. Now, if I go back to Unity here, I'm just going to hit play. By just bringing on that Robbie body here, I'm going to have most of my animations in place. And we're going to take a look at how this has happened in a second. But you can see I got crouching and running and all that stuff. And even when I idle, you'll see the mesh deformation stuff happening in the torso. Stuff that's a bit harder to do with sprites in runtime, like if, unless you've pre-planned it or have these baked into a sprite sheet or whatever. These are actual animations doing this. And the one piece we don't have right now is jumping. So if I come over here and actually jump, you'll see nothing happens. We're going to set that part up. Uh, and if I jump and then hold on there, I've got my hanging and all that, but jumping itself, nothing. All right? We thought before, hey, we could set up some simple state and transition, but that's easy. We have tons of documentation on it, so we're going to do something better. We're going to set up a blend tree, which almost no one has ever used, and it's really cool and powerful, so we're going to do that instead. Before we get to that, I'm going to go ahead and open up the animate tour that's going to allow me to see this. And I'm going to do that by selecting my Robbie body here. And I'm going to go to window and not animate shun, but animate tour. I have to say it funny like that. And here is the animate tour controller. Um, there we go. Pan around. And you can see that I have my grounded state, my crouch, midair, which is not set up yet and hanging. And these are all pretty simple. So I have some parameters, you know, speed is crouching, is hanging. And you can see, like, I'm going to transition from my grounded state to my crouching state uh, just basically whenever is crouching equals true, right? So nothing really complex there. And if I keep that selected while I hit play, we'll actually see I'm in the grounded state. You could see it playing there. And if I hit down, I'm in the crouching state. And when I jump, I'm in the midair state. And if I grab the ledge, I'm in the hanging state, and so on and so forth. So the only part not set up is midair. The last thing I want to show you before we kind of move forward into it is I'm going to open up the animation window, animation, not animator, and I'll click on Robbie body here, and I want to pull up uh, uh, running. And if I look right here, that is a, an event. You can see that event calls the method step audio. audio. That's how we did that. So if I'm looking at Robbie in the scene view here, there he is. I start scrubbing this line. You can see one footstep plays the audio. Next footstep plays the audio. And then this loops back around. And that's how we keep audio in sync with our animation. So if I play this animation faster, it'll play the footstep audio more often, staying in sync. If I play it slower, it'll call it slower, stays in sync. Creating these events are easy. I could just move my scrubber to any part and then just hit that button. That creates an event. And then in my animation event in the inspector, I just pick what method it calls of any script that's on it. All right? Now, I don't want this, so I'll just control Z that. But um, that's how these are set up. Nothing really, you know, spectacular or difficult there. And I will just close that window. Okay. So all I've really done at this point is I've dragged on the Robbie body, turned off my sprite. I haven't done much. So let's set up this animator, this blend tree. So if I look at grounded, uh, if I click on the grounded state, I will notice it's a blend tree. So is crouch. Crouch is also a blend tree because grounded could be idle or walking or running. And if I say double click on grounded, you'll see that I have this state where it's idle or walking or running. And if I look here in my preview, as I drag this, we can see him going between the, the different states and, and whatever. So I'm going to back out here. And now I want to set up midair to be the same way. So as we talked about before, jumping is falling we meant to do. So I don't need a jumping state and then a falling state. One of the difficulties people have when they work on animations for platformers and games like this is they have a jumping animation that is a set animation, but at the end of that jumping animation, what happens? What happens if they're still in the air and the animation's done? Well, then they're, 
what do they do? Does it loop back around and they play the jumping animation again? They just start running mid-air? Or what happens, you know, if they land before the animation is finished? You know, at what point do you transition from a jumping animation into a falling animation, right? So we're going to treat them all the same. And we're going to break up several small animations and blend all the way across them through the whole spectrum of going up, cresting out, and falling back down. We're going to do this with seven individual uh, um, animations. So I'm going to click on my blend tree here. And over here in the inspector, the first thing I care about is what parameter am I blending on? Well, speed is how I determine if I'm standing still, walking, or running. The same with crouching. So I don't want speed. I want my vertical velocity. That's telling me up or down. In case anyone wonders if why I use speed for one and vertical velocity for the other, velocity means direction is included. So up and down. Speed is always zero or positive. It's not a scalar value. And if anyone cares, math folks, hey. Um, all right, so vertical velocity is what we're doing here. You're muted. Whoa, Whoa. math folks? Math folks. Maths. Oh, you're right. In Europe, it's maths. It's maths. maths. Is that like sciencing something? Yeah. All right, fair enough. Maths. Well, I'm going to math some motion fields here because I'm adding it, and that's math. Um, so I'm going to click the plus sign here. And I'm going to click Add Motion Field. And I'm going to do this seven times. I need seven animations. So we're just going to do this seven times, which is super fun to watch me have to do. Do, to do. do. Um, that seems about right. So seven animations here. And I'm just going to start adding my mid-air animations. And the order that I add them is not going to matter because I'm going to start giving them some threshold values, and that's going to resort my list for me. So I'm just going to click the little circle selector here. And so I'm going to do mid-air one, and then mid-air two, and so on and so forth down the line. We're going to add all seven of these, our mid-air animations. Don't worry, we're going to post all of these values in the slides. You're not going to have to remember all this stuff. Uh, but I just need to add all of these. I added five twice. That's not good. Six and seven. All right. So this added all seven of these animations. And if I look at the preview of Robbie right down here, I can now blend. Uh, Keep dragging the wrong thing there. I can now blend this little slider, and we can watch him go from jumping to cresting out to falling. And you can even see it here as we blend between these animations. Right there. So each of these animations is only a single keyframe. But we're using those single keyframes, and we're blending across them, just like a normal animation, a multi-keyframed animation does with tweening. We're using the blend tree to tween. We're creating a dynamic animation from seven keyframes. So there we go. So I might fall for a longer period of time. Or maybe I start just falling. Maybe I didn't jump. So I start here and just fall, but I don't play the jumping part. Right? And so I'm just controlling it this way. Now the problem I have is these values are zero to six. And that doesn't make sense because I'm passing in my velocity. So I need to change these threshold values to make it work. And so I'm just going to start doing that. I like to start at the bottom here. So that's what I'm going to do. So for mid-air seven, that's going to be when I'm falling the fastest. This is my falling, like straight plumbing animation. So this is going to have a value of negative 16. Negative 16. And you'll notice it reorders. It moved to the top of the list because that's my lowest value, right? So it's, it popped way up there. So the next one is going to be my mid-air 6, and that's going to have a value of negative 12. My mid-air 5 is going to have a value of negative 9. My mid-air 4 is going to have a value of 0. So 4 is where I crest out. 4 is where I, I hit the maximum as I'm jumping and then I start to fall. So then 3 is going to have a value of 4. There we go. 2 is going to have a value of 8. And then I did one wrong here. So, oh, then 1, I'm oh, sorry, it's going to have a value of 10. Now, you might be wondering, how did I come up with these values? Well, I simply put a script that just outputted my vertical velocity all the time, and I jumped a lot. And I saw, what was my initial velocity? Where did I end up? And OK, those are my two sides. And then I built a parabolic curve. And when I say built a parabolic curve, I mean this. You will notice how these values are closer together, and these values are closer together, but these values are stretched out. That is what gives us that lofty feel, right? So I jump and I have a longer period of time of this loft, these longer blend here, before I fall more sharply. All right, so instead of it just being a nice even amount, it's gonna pitch up quickly, crest out, and then pitch down quickly. And that's gonna feel like a jump. And so those are my values there. And we can just see how it blends across. So now, all that done, I'll leave this open here. I'll hit play. We'll actually watch it in real time 
go here. So if I, uh, if I jump, you'll watch it go through so it spikes down and then back up. There we go. And if I fall, you'll notice how it doesn't play the jumping animations, it just plays the falling animations. There we go, because I didn't jump, I just fell, but all of it's midair. All right, and so that is my animation uh, for my character jumping, the blend tree, because again, we noticed a lot of people don't use blend trees, and they really should, they're very powerful. Okay, this was a lot of talking, and it's actually quite a fiddly step, so I hope you were paying attention. There's a lot of little clicks and stuff, but we have some graphics and stuff to help. So here's what you're gonna do for this step. You're going to select Robbie, uh, and you're going to go down to the Robbie folder and locate the Robbie body prefab, and you're going to drag it onto the Robbie game object in the um, hierarchy here. You want to do it in the hierarchy because if you try to drag it in the scene or you drag it and then try to put it on Robbie, they're not going to be positioned correctly. You'll know you did it right because you will see, you know, Robbie body right behind your Robbie sprite. Then what you're going to do is with Robbie body selected, you're going to go to Window and then Animate Tor. That's going to open your Animate Tor window. You're going to double click on the mid-air state, and you're going to select your blend tree. You're going to add seven motion fields by clicking the plus arrow and clicking add motion field. And you're going to set the seven motion fields to be mid-air one through seven. And then you're going to give it these values here, which again, we're going to put up on the slide. When that's done, the last thing you're going to do is you're going to click back on the Robbie parent object here, and you're just going to disable the sprite render. You could remove it or just disable it, whatever. Save your scene, and now you should have a, a Robbie that's reacting to light, it's running, crouching, animating, and jumping. Uh, and test it out. Just as a quick note, like Mike pointed out, but I want to point out again, definitely make sure that when you input the thresholds, you realize that it reshuffles all of them automatically. So you might accidentally type into the wrong fields, which is why the screenshot's there. So make sure they're all in the right, uh, the right order. All right, everyone, real quick, as you're working, a lot of you have noticed there's an issue if you crouch jump. And I thought, oh, hey, that's weird. I haven't seen that yet. So let me explain. This is my fault, by the way. I modified some code yesterday, naturally. Uh, and because I was like, oh, hey, here's a really clever way of doing this thing. What's effectively happening is while I crouch and I jump, it fluctuates between the grounded and crouched before popping the midair. And that, you know, sometimes it happens on this one, sometimes it doesn't, but that makes it look like there's two Robbies for a split second. That's my fault. The problem, again, it's, it's a, my fault. I thought I was being clever, but uh, inside my, my ground movement here, I changed it so that as long as you're not crouching and you're holding, holding the crouch button and not pressing it for the first time, you will enter a crouch state as long as you are still within range of the ground to be on the ground. All right, when you jump, you're still within the ground distance even though you're on your way up. So for that split second, you can re-enter the crouch state. That's my mistake. So yeah, I will fix that bit of code and show you all how later. Uh, but I thought I was being clever yesterday. This is what I get for making code changes the day before we have a training day. So to be, to be fair, <laughs> in Austin last year, I was making code changes the night before and that Cause problem. That so. always happens. We, I don't know why. We, when we'll learn to stop changing code the day before we do one of these things. But so anyway, it's not you, it's me. We can all thank Chris back here uh, because he did the work, so I didn't have to. So if we go to our player movement right underneath ground movement, line 145, and add the and not is jumping right here, that fixes that problem that I so erringly uh, created when I edited my code. So thank you. Round of applause for Chris. What a guy. What a guy. Thank you, Chris.